Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Council Conversations. My name is Disha Clifford, and I'm a director at Council, and I am your moderator this morning. Our guest speakers are Bob Reichardt and Scott Argue from Sastel, who will be sharing their expertise on empowering digital transformation by investing in human capital. Just a bit about Scott and Bob. For nearly 20 years, Scott has been a key contributor to Saskel's market growth internationally. In the role of VP of Client Services, Scott has had full oversight of SI IT's operations, customer experience, and works directly with customers globally. Scott leads the multifunctional client services department to support sales channels and deliver innovative solutions to meet the unique needs of SI's customers. And for Bob, with over 20 years of management experience in customer services, business support, sales and solutions, and technical divisions of Sastel and Sastel International, Bob is a management professional who has contributed to the development and delivery of multiple corporate objectives and successfully led team members in the delivery of solutions to improve customer operations. Before I hand over to our experts, I just want to remind you to please post your questions in the chat and also be sure to stay tuned to the end of the session because we'll be randomly choosing one winner here to receive an Amazon voucher. Over to you, Scott and Bob. Awesome, thanks very much, Disha, and uh, welcome everybody. It's always great to engage with Canto. I've had the opportunity to speak uh, a number of times with Canto and, and come to some of the conferences, so always a pleasure. I wanna add one thing to the introduction, I think, uh, Barb's intro, you said 20 years, I believe she just hit 25 years with our company and so should recognize that. Congratulations, Barb. I think that's in the last week or two. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, here a little bit today to talk about uh, digital transformation and, and how you can empower that by investing in your people. And so got a, a slide deck that we're going to walk through uh, and speak to some of the slides. Uh, myself and Barb will tag team a little bit, so we'll be back and forth on some of the slides. Um, and then at the end, we would like to get some conversation going and uh, and certainly ask ask and answer any questions that people have. So without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, get into it. So just maybe a little bit of background on SASTEL and SASTEL International to help uh, folks on the line who don't know us understand who we are and, and maybe why you might want to listen to us or you might want to talk to us. So SASTEL International, uh, we've been around since 1986. Uh, we were really established uh, when SASTEL at that time had built the largest fiber optic network in the world in, in Saskatchewan. And um, it, it created opportunities for us to go out in partnership with Nortel and build networks around the world. And that was really the genesis of, of the founding of SASTEL International. Uh, we like to call it a telecom company built by a telecom company. So it was really built by our parent company, SASTEL, who is an operator here in Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, we are wholly owned by them and, and SASTEL, there's more details coming up later, but uh, you know, we're wholly owned by SASTEL, we get our direction from them. And we really have two key lines of business. One is uh, you know, we offer a suite of software that helps to empower uh, telecom networks. So really inventory and activate services across those networks. And we offer professional services consulting where we help uh, clients build new networks, new products, new services uh, in a variety of ways, leveraging the expertise that we have from our parent company. So about our parent company, they're about a billion three to a billion five in revenue, depending on the year. Around 3,400 employees these days have been around for 110 years, so longer than, than SASTEL International. Um, they own and operate the biggest network in the province of Saskatchewan, and it connects 99% of the, the province in terms of population. Uh, the, the, the province is, is very large. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I talk to people in the Caribbean and I compare our province, which is landlocked to the Caribbean, uh, in that, you know, we have a number of large centers that we have to serve, and then we've got big, vast open areas <laughs> where there's nothing, and then a lot of small population that we have to serve. So very similar to some of the Caribbean islands where, you know, you have population on large islands and you need to serve some of the other islands that are smaller. Um, the In terms of SASTEL, you know, one of the great things about it is, uh, you know, we're able to pull on their resources to help us with our projects. So we're able to bring expertise that works out of the parent company. Uh, to come and work with with folks like yourselves. Um, another point I should make is I think I'm about almost 20 years with the company. Um, when I started, there was about 5,000 employees in SASTEL, um, and there were less than a billion dollars in revenue. So in 20 years, the, the revenue has gone up uh, significantly. The employee base has gone down somewhat. The complexity of the networks that are deployed and the number of products and services that are deployed are, are significantly larger. 
than they were when I started. And one of the ways that SaaStel has been able to achieve that is, is through automation and, and the deployment of, of digital transformation. So just in terms of SaaStel International, we do have a lot of experience. Like I said, since the 80s, we've done over 100 projects uh, across the globe, basically. And each one of those little dots represents some, some place we've done some work. Uh, and there's a few dots that aren't on that uh, screen yet, but uh, they're going to show up shortly. And uh, our, our role or goal really is to go out and help connect the world. You know, we, uh, we have a set of expertise uh, that we're able to pull out of our parent company and within our own company to go out and help uh, underserved or, or uh, underdeveloped countries to, to build new networks, new products, new services. I'll flip it over to Barb for this one. Thanks, Scott. So uh, digital transformation, I know that's the buzzword that's out there. So what, what does it really involve and what does it really mean? So through that automation is necessary for telecoms to be competitive. So, you know, with our, with our own parent company, you know, what we've done in order to keep up with uh, customer demand, customer expectations, and also employee enablement is over, you know, over the years, we've tried to automate, uh, you know, more uh, mundane, low value tasks and, um, you know, we've done that through a number of ways. You know, one of them is even through training, training our folks. So, you know, we used to have the old standard training where you had these great big binders, you know, you trained, trained folks for weeks on end. It took months and months and months before they were productive, you know, and how we've transformed that is everything is virtual. It's online. Uh, we train, you know, we train our folks on the actual technical aspects of their job and teach them how to use uh, our knowledge tools in order to look things up. So instead of having tedious training on exact procedures and mops and that sort of thing, we've actually just made uh, knowledge bases and teach employees how to do that. So we've done that. And then as far for customers go, you know, customers want to interact with, with us and you guys in the channel they want when they want. You know, in order to do that, you have to have, you know, 24 seven environments, or at least it needs to appear like that to the customer, you need to automate those, you know, those low value tasks or things that can happen quickly, you know, such as um, channel changes, bandwidth, those kind of things, you know, and that became even more and more um, a reality for us during COVID and for many of you. So, you know, Scott's got a really good example because he's got a busy household and, uh, you know, even just what happened to him and his family during COVID, um, you know, suddenly everybody was sent home that week. Uh, you know, Scott's got a full family at home and uh, they needed bandwidth fast. So maybe I'll let you tell that story, Scott. Yeah, for sure. So uh, <laughs> we're all pretty well aware of what happened with COVID. Um, our situation was a little unique. In, in February of 2020, we could see COVID coming. And as a company, we, we made a choice. We, we decided to send everybody to home, uh, to work from home for a week on a trial basis, just to make sure that we didn't have any technology issues or challenges. Um, we, we knew we were set up for it, but we wanted to sort of prove it out. And, and so we sent everybody home fairly early in February of 2020. Uh, to work from home and it worked perfectly and in fact we never went back to the office at that point because COVID was starting to ramp up and the concerns were were emerging. Um, within a week or so everything else started to shut down here in Canada and I'm sure the same in, in the Caribbean. Um, you know school shut down, businesses shut down. Um, in my house Barb mentioned a little bit busy. My wife's a teacher um, so she had to come home and, and get online and you know, of course, I was trying to help her to understand how to use things like Zoom and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I've got a son who's in grade seven. His classes went online and we have our niece living with us going to university and her classes went online. So literally within uh, the span of a week, our bandwidth needs throughout the day train just changed 180 degrees. And, uh, you know, we're all struggling uh, with trying to get video going and sort of having good sessions. Um, and, uh, you know, the kids, I think we're watching, you know, YouTube or, or Netflix while they're doing their own work as well. So, so that didn't help. Um, so I knew I needed more bandwidth. And again, the nice part is working for SASTEL. Um, I, I know some of the capabilities that are available. Uh, lots of people were phoning into our contact centers saying, I need to get internet. Some people who didn't have it needed to get it now or, uh, you know, they needed to up the bandwidth. But, you know, I knew there's self-serve options. We have a, a website uh, called mysastel.com where I'm able to go in and log into my profile. So literally within minutes, I was able to go in and, and upgrade from 150 megabits a second to 300 megabits per second symmetrical. 
uh, with a click of a button, that got provisioned within a few minutes and all done in an automated fashion. So I didn't have to talk to anybody. Nobody inside of SASTEL had to put hands to keyboard to make those things happen. My service was automatically upgraded as well as my bill. And so, <laughs> you know, that's that's why we talk about passive income streams is, you know, the, the telco really overnight through that customer self-serve channel that they invested years to get in place, it started generating revenue for them in a passive way. Uh, you know, nobody was on the phone, nobody was, was working through those uh, upgrades. They just happened. And at the end of the month, the revenues were higher, right? And so that passive income stream is something that can be, be driven out through through uh, digital transformation and, and investing in, in automation. And, uh, you know, again, very valuable for me personally. I didn't have to wait online to, in, a, in a call queue to call center. I just went in, uh, clicked the buttons, and a few minutes later, you know, I had the services that I wanted uh, all done automatically without anybody uh, being involved. Sorry, there we go. And really, again, that's the digital transformation part that we want to talk about, about a little bit. And that is, you know, as Barb alluded to, how do you automate some of those repetitive tasks or the tasks where the customer wants to engage with you when they want, where they want and how they want, um, you know, being able to sort of have that process where I could go in and, and, and pick, see what feeds and speeds were available for me, pick the, the, the package that was right for me and get a provision zero touch without having to engage anyone extremely valuable to me personally at that time as I was still trying to manage my business, trying to help my wife get online, trying to help my son with his homework, you know, a lot of balls that I was juggling and to sort of get on a phone and, and talk to somebody and get that service provision just wasn't an option, but to be able to go in and do it uh, in a self-serve manner was extremely valuable. Pass this over to Barb. So as Scott was saying, you know, in order to get things transformed. Also, you know, as we see things transforming, the, the workforce is transforming a lot. So, you know, those in their 20s and 30s, you know, certainly have a strong technical aptitude and also, you know, are looking to um, get retraining. You know, a lot have been displaced because of COVID. You know, they're they're eager to get reskilled, you know, obtain, you know, all the, the technical knowledge and skills that they need. Um, you know, in order to keep working and, you know, really that is the, the back, they are the backbone of our future economy. So um, as Scott said, him and I, you know, have a combined of probably over 50 years. So we're not, <laughs> we're getting a little uh, long in the tooth. We're not in our twenties and thirties anymore, but folks coming in, you know, they, they're looking for that and they're looking for really meaningful work, um, you know, and they're looking they're looking for some different things, um, you know, than some of us who are a little bit older were when we started. So, you know, they really want to be part of, part of meaningful work. They, you know, want to use their skills to the to their fullest potential. And I think they're looking for companies that they believe in and they can grow in. So, well, um, you know, automation handles mundane, repetitive, low value tasks, you know, what you can do then is focus your employees and, and focus really, uh, you know, their smarts on, you know, higher value work, engaging those employees, making sure that they're, they're serving your customers well, they're growing with the company, and you're keeping that knowledge within your company, you know, by growing those people with your company, you know, it, it um, generates loyalty, you know, we, we as a company um, have some different hiring practices from, you know, that the uh, folks that we hire in our contact centers and our front facing uh, jobs where we try and hire students, you know, that are um, partway through university that we know they're taking degrees and education in areas that will serve the telco later. So we can, you know, they can learn our business, learn what we do, how we make money, how we serve customers, and then go on to into those departments such as finance, um, you know, IT, engineering, uh, marketing, those type of things, but the base of their understanding is how how we make money as a company, uh, which has you know been super valuable to us. Yeah, yeah, I'll just build on that a little bit, Barb. Um, 
you know, we we're very fortunate, uh, you know, our employment is really sticky. Uh, and it's partly because we we bring people in early. Uh, as Barb said, lots of people start in our organization while they're in university. And that's by design. And that really allows us to retain uh, folks for a long time. We have some some folks, you know, on our engineering teams, as an example, that have been here 25, 30 years, and, you know, certainly have the opportunity to go elsewhere and probably make far more money. Uh, but they stay with our company just because they've grown up in the company and they have that stickiness. So it's really valuable to us. So skilled and experienced personnel, you know, and what we've noticed over the years too is, you know, if like Scott said, if we can hire people and they can grow with the company, you know, people perform at higher levels, they have more loyalty to the company, you know, have higher job satisfaction because they're not, you know, doing the same job every day for 25 years. They are growing with the company and they are learning new things, um, learning, especially in a technology field, you know, telecom is, um, always changing and it's hard to keep up. So um, there's enough change that people really grow with the company and it allows them to keep going and, you know, have a lot of succession planning. Um, so it's worked really well for us investing in folks over the years and retraining and reskilling people. Yeah, absolutely. And I can speak to this a little bit further selfishly. Uh, one of the things I'm measured on uh, is, is our employee satisfaction and you know, we, we recently completed our, our annual uh, review and we're, we're very close to 90% in our employee satisfaction rate, which is, you know, in the industry phenomenal and uh, something we're really proud of. I want to speak to this one. This is a, you know, a, a project that uh, I was pretty closely involved in. And it's a real example of, of, of this being done in the Caribbean. And, and that is uh, uh, the building of Alive with Cable Bahamas. So SASTEL International, we partnered with Cable Bahamas. We helped uh, with the, the build of the Alive network. Um, and uh, this is a, a Facebook video uh, of a couple of the, the uh, young engineers who were involved in, in the building of the network, uh, Ricardo and Trico. Um, and this is a project where Cable Bahamas, uh, you know, really had the foresight to say, we need to hire young people that are skilled and we need to grow them in the organization. Very similar to what we just talked about with SASTEL. Um, and, and so they, they set up, you know, this graduate engineering program and they went out and they recruited engineers that were coming right out of the university in Bahamas. And they put them into some training, uh, uh, you know, training with the vendor, the vendor's equipment, but they also paired them up with some of our resources. So SASTEL resources for each of these job functions uh, were there and were supporting these folks as they learned and, and grew. And so, so the, these young engineers were involved right from the start in both building the network, but also learning how the network was built. And I would say learning to be passionate about telecommunications. And, uh, it, you know, it's really interesting uh, a Facebook video that, uh, that, they, that they mentioned uh, sort of that the passion that they, that they developed through building and growing this network and partly through the partnership that they had with us. And, and the difference that we were able to help bring to that opportunity was really that operational telecom experience. So, um, you know, you can read the books, you can get the training, but having somebody who's actually done, done the work before is very valuable. And our model is a little bit different. You know, we, we don't want to be in these opportunities where we're embedding people forever. We want to be there to help transition knowledge and, and actually get out. And that's part of how we develop our people as well. So our our people have the opportunity to go out and, and experience different networks, different cultures, different worlds, and uh, bring that knowledge back into our own organization. So we use it as a development uh, opportunity as well. And, you know, really in terms of investing in human capital, this is a great example of, of Cable Bahamas having the, the foresight to go out and sort of hire these young people uh, and, and bring them in and try to create that stickiness that we talked about uh, that, that keeps these people in the organization and passionate for years to come. Scott, if I can just add to that, uh, one of the things, you know, myself um, working, especially in our IT department in SASTEL over the years, you know, which we, we've we often struggled with and we really search for partners who can do this is we've hired uh, folks that have a specific expertise to come in and help us, you know, transform or, um, you know, build new IT systems and, uh, you know, implement things. And unfortunately, we haven't always hired the right partner. And then that knowledge has walked out the door and left when, when the vendor leaves. And then, you know, as the IT staff left behind, you're left to support this brand new thing that you don't necessarily know how to do. 
because uh, you were, you know, you had a small part in in the project because you brought in a, a great big vendor or a, a vendor to build it. So as Scott said, you know, one of the things that we've we try to do when we work with people, and this is just from our own experience, is like he said, we try and partner with people. Uh, we're, we're not wanting to stay on site for years and years on end, and we're not wanting to keep that knowledge. We're wanting to build that in-house with the, with the partners that we work with and the companies we work with. And like Scott said, we're looking to bring that knowledge back home and we're looking to put our folks back into the telco doing uh, you know, the jobs they left or sometimes brand new jobs, as Scott said, they get development opportunities. But you know, it was really important for us as one of our values to um, work like that because, um, you know, Scott and I have both been part of that, especially as part of the telco where we've implemented new things and then we, we weren't able to support it. Um, so it's one of the things that's very important to us as a partner. So I think Scott said in this example, uh, you know, it worked really well working with these, um, these younger engineers, you know, bringing in some uh, experienced engineers uh, for a time being, training them on the implementation of it. And then, you know, our engineers came home and, uh, you know, are now building our 5G network. Yeah, it's uh, one of the quotes on the, the video that I really liked was uh, uh, Trico said, you know, the operational experience sometimes is the difference between knowing when to use a piece of electrical tape versus replace a piece of equipment, right? And and there's just some of those, those experiences that you don't get unless you've had the experience. You can't, you know, you can't get experience without experience. And, and uh, you know, so the key is finding partners that can come and help you build that experience and do it in the right way to grow your human capital internally, in my opinion. Um, again, uh, I'll speak to this one a little bit, Barb can jump in, but, you know, the investing in your people is really about that retention strategy. How do you make it sticky? How do you make, make your, your employees want to be with you? And, and you know, the way, way to do that is to give them those experiences, give them the training, give them the opportunities. Um, it'll build their ownership in the network or in the business and build their passion. Um, it, you know, the Facebook video I just pointed to, you, you can really hear the passion in the voice of, of those two young, young fellows who, you know, they've, they've come in, I think, to a totally different career than they might have imagined for themselves, but, but they're extremely passionate about it. And they built that up in a, in a period of only a couple of years. Um, and, you know, if, if you're able to do that, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to train people up and people are going to go out and find other opportunities and they're going to leave your company. Uh, but hopefully that's a small amount. And if you're doing it right, people will see that there's opportunity and that you are building people for the future and building for the next opportunity, whether that's internal to your company or external, and that'll make you an employer of choice. And, and you'll, you'll get the pick of the litter in terms of, of new young people coming into the organization. Uh, again, Barb mentioned this a couple of times, but Really, you know, it's about trying to build that knowledge base up internally, insourcing that knowledge to your company so that you have it and you retain it, and that you can uh, elevate people. So uh, have people focus on the higher value work and anything that's repetitive, uh, sort of mundane, try to automate wherever possible. Uh, and, and if you can take people away from those mundane tasks and give them higher value tasks, give them more training, they're going to be well invested in your company for the future. Not sure if you had anything to add, Barb. I think so, and it, it might it might be a common problem as well in in the Caribbean. But one of the things is, as Scott said, in in Saskatchewan we have a couple medium sized cities and then a lot of smaller centers. So often, you know, when kids are, uh, you know, I guess young adults getting into university and leaving university, often want to move, you know, to the larger centers outside of Saskatchewan where there's you know more excitement and you know more challenging jobs. So also you know, we want to keep, we want to keep people at home in our province. So we have a skilled workforce and they're not leaving uh, for other places. Um, so, you know, this is partly how to do that, you know, to make sure that you do have high value jobs that people do want to stay, um, you know, in your communities and help build those communities as well. And one way to do that is by having, um, you know, higher value work in the areas so people can stay in their community, stay in your communities. So, yeah, that's a real good point, Barb. We've we've been very fortunate here at SaskTel and in Saskatchewan to be able to retain a lot of our, our knowledge, uh, local people, and attract uh, new knowledge to the area as well. So, you know, this all starts with a conversation. I, I always say that, you know, it's... Uh, uh, you know, everybody's looking to transform their businesses and, and to transform digitally. And, you know, the phrase really means different things to different people. 
And uh, so, as I say, start with a conversation. You know, we, we believe that, uh, you know, we have some experiences and some knowledge and some capabilities, uh, and we're willing to share those. Uh, one of the unique things about our parent company is they only operate within the province of Saskatchewan. So, you know, we're never going to go out and compete with somebody in another jurisdiction. Uh, so we're kind of a friendly, uh, a friendly uh, partner and a friendly uh, peer in the industry to, to engage with. And we're very open. So, you know, uh, if anyone ever wants to hear about some things that are going on at SaskTel, we're willing to plug them into the, the, the peers that they would have in our company that are are doing those functions have experienced, uh, you know, some of the some of the things that you're trying to experience, and we'll share that knowledge, sort of good, bad, and otherwise of of our successes as well as our failures, and we're willing to do that anytime. It's not a transactional thing where you know we have to to generate business from those opportunities. We're really willing to share that information, and the reason we're willing to share it is we find that it does turn into opportunities for us. People uh, understand that we have some capabilities. They're able to leverage our experience, both the failures and the successes. And, uh, you know, that turns into opportunities for us to come and, and help, uh, you know, build new networks, new products, new services, or, you know, could be things like operational processes, experiences that we have that we're able to, to, to bring. Um, again, we're, we're a pretty trusted partner. We've done a fair bit of work uh, in the Caribbean and around the world. And, uh, you know, we, we really understand we're, we're an operator first and a, and a services company second. So we really understand your businesses and, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, have ways that we can come in and help. And that firsthand operational telecom expertise that we have is really invaluable, especially if, if it's a, an area of the business that you're short on that expertise or you're, you're trying to build it up. Uh, we can sort of bring it with real world operational experience versus theoretical, uh, which is very valuable. Not sure if you had anything to add there, Barb. No, I think that's I think that's good, Scott. It um it really does make a difference. Um, and you know we do lots of as, as Scott said, we do a lot of information sharing just back and forth, even between uh, the companies that we partner with. You know, even just getting permission to share from one company to another. As Scott said, we we aren't really a competitor of anybody, <laughs> so uh, which is nice uh, for the companies we work with. And um, you know just willing to share information of all, all sorts, anything, anything that kind of goes on in the business. So happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, really in terms of the digital transformation, you know, I would say it's invest in your, your networks and your automations, invest in your people, try to remove those lower value tasks from people having hands on keyboard to deliver, automate those and reinvest that uh, time from those people into higher value tasks and into transforming your company more digitally. And really that's sort of the, the end of our presentation portion, but we really are hopeful that we can get some conversation going here. And uh, so, you know, I know there's a number of folks on the line. Uh, we'd like to open it up if there's any questions really about anything, whether it's about this presentation or anything telecom related. Uh, between Barb and I, we can likely answer uh, a vast majority of those questions. And if we can't answer it, we can take it away and we can find somebody within our company who can. So any questions? You scored Bob and yes, just please post your questions in the chat. Um, that was an interesting presentation. I think um, from my perspective, what I think differentiates um, Saskia from other consultancy firms is the actual freestand operational experience. Um, just think of my experience with working with consultants, sometimes what they give you ends up being aspirational because there's often a disconnect between um, what you can do based on real world constraints, resource constraints, operational constraints. So the fact that you guys are in the trenches, I think that means that the advice and support you offer will actually be very pragmatic and something that can be um, utilized immediately. Um, a question is, um, I, I think some of the examples you gave were automation of customer facing processes, um, particularly um, the example you gave Scott when your family entered the throes of the pandemic and how you adjusted your home life to that. Um, is there a lot of options or are there a lot of options for automating of sort of back office processes as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll maybe let Barb speak to that, but I'll, I'll touch on it first. I, I think one of the things we've done in our, in our own company is automate some of those internal processes first and then expose them to, to the client. So we can sort of prove out the, the value and some of the internal uh, ways that we can save time within our own day to day tasks. And then where it makes sense, expose them to the client. Barb, you might be able to speak a little bit closer to that. I know you're involved in a couple of projects where we did exactly that. Yeah, so one of our strategies um, when we were kind of really transforming our CRM, which started 
many, many years ago, I think any of you uh, folks who've done CRM projects, they kind of just go on from one to the next to the next. So, you know, one of the main pillars that we used was we would um, deploy it to our front end agents first and try it out, kind of get all the all the bugs worked out and the feedback and then it, then deploy it to the customer. And then the next round, we would do the same, deploy it to the employees and then out to the customer on, you know, self-serve channels. So we really tried to do that. And then that other example I used, you know, even from our in-house training, um, you know, so trying to really, you know, virtualize, transform that, make it easier to learn, faster to learn, um, you know, even our onboarding materials, that kind of thing. A lot of that is self-serve now. There's videos, um, you know, that lead you through forms, all that, you know, any of you who started a company years ago, I mean, most of your first day was filling out forms, but, you know, we've tried to um, even internally improve, you know, uh, even our testing processes over the years, you know, just automating test processes and making sure that we have automated tests running all the time. You know, in our self-serve environment, uh, we run tests to make sure the environment is up and working in an automated fashion, uh, you know, multiple times a day to make sure that that uh, channel is never down. Whereas we used to have a person logged in at all hours of the day, you know, every how many hours logging in. So we've really used uh, automation for a lot of those tasks now. And, you know, they were mundane. It was someone doing a regression test over and over and over. So now we have, um, you know, automation taking place for that. And then I'm, from my personal perspective, um, I think as competition evolves in the Caribbean, um, you find that the industries are maturing. So we're no longer competing on network coverage um, and probably not even on price if the um, regulations allow for sufficiently robust competition. So another key differentiator is that customer touch point, um, being available to your customers 24 um, seven. What kind of tools, um, do you use to facilitate 24 7 interaction or, or what 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 suite of um, tools would you suggest to your clients to facilitate 24 7 interaction between um, a telco and a customer do you want to take that one barb sure so you know right from um you know our our front end applications from a crm application you know all the way through to you know a network element uh, basically all of our projects now are heavily, you know, heavy integration projects, you know, to make sure that that happens all the way through. So, you know, as Scott said, not only for broadband, but certainly for wireless, you know, we, we compete in the security space as well. Um, TV, all of that, but we make sure right from our, um, you know, our stores to our online channels, you know, when people walk into a store, when they leave, you know, their, their wireless device is working, you know, or they can get a channel upgrade. So right from our CRM back to our OSS system, which is, is uh, SaskTel International built and owned all the way back to the activation system that activates the network elements, um, certainly is an in-house solution as well from SaskTel International. Um, that's how we kind of keep it all going. And it, it is that zero touch, um, but we need to connect it to the front end, to the CRM in order to take that. And then, you know, when we're done our transactions, it gets sent off to billing. So slowly we've, you know, picked off those transactions one by one and, uh, you know, certainly sped some up during COVID when we needed, you know, contactless delivery, especially for uh, our technicians and those sort of things. So often that's the hardest and people I'm sure in the Caribbean as well, the technician experience uh, wasn't heavily automated, <laughs> um, you know, but that's really um, had to speed up just because of COVID and having contactless, um, you know, as much contactless services as possible. Yeah, and I, just to build on that and, and sort of touch on the front end of what you mentioned, Disha, you know, um, we're very much there where we have competition in all of our lines of business. Um, you know, the network feeds and speeds are comparable with our competitors. Uh, price is, is always uh, comparable uh, or, you know, we're, we're battling against lower prices from our competition. And, you know, we really try to focus on the customer engagement side of things. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things we had on the side of all of our vans for a number of years was, you know, our focus is our customer, our strength is our people. And uh, we really firmly believe that, you know, we invest in the people 
we have the people passionate about our business and passionate about serving our clients. And, uh, you know, that passion shows through and we've got, you know, a dominant market share across all lines of business, despite heavy competition as a result of that investment. I do see a question here in the chat from Maria um, asking about uh, telecom solutions for hotlines or other multi-line responses. And I'm, not sure exactly what the, the, the question is, so I'm not sure if we can open Maria up to ask the question. Maria O'Brien. Hi. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, I work along as part of the MHBSS Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Network for Trinidad and Tobago, and we have tons of regional partners and a lot of our hotlines. And what I mean, when I say hotlines, I mean like, um, you know, emergency hotlines. <laughs> That are being run by nonprofits. Sometimes, in some cases, we have a virtual solution called Find KTC, where um, so some we evaluate these hotlines um, to verify them for the public, right? And it seems to me that one of the issues could be um, a, a variety of solutions, or maybe there is a low awareness around telecommunication solutions around this. I actually did some Google searches around it, and it's actually doesn't produce a lot of results around hotline solutions. So um, I know you you said that we could ask you anything telecoms related. So this yeah. was actually this was actually something that really does affect the effectiveness of these emergency helplines. Um, we we encounter a lot of issues with, um, and I actually think a virtual solution in many cases can be very very helpful. So we've been testing out a few. Um, AI solutions for fine care, um, but it would be great to know if there are other things that we should be looking into um, to help to help the overall network, but also to help the solutions that we're building. So we'd love to know if you guys have suggestions or even companies that you could point us in the direction of, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. So, so you know, I, I think you're asking a couple of questions, but the main one is uh, really sort of how do you I think what you're looking for is sort of a virtual contact center solution, right? Where you could have uh, people that could be available to, to take calls from, from, from mental health clients sort of virtually from home, exactly. from other locations. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so those, those uh, applications exist. Um, uh, there's a number of them. In fact, SASTEL, our parent company has one that, that we offer uh, only in Canada, unfortunately, but uh, you know, certainly we could talk about it. Um, Basically, the model for that is, you know, uh, a call center type agent can come in through a computer, log in uh, to the service, uh, and they automatically can enter into a queue or into a queued infrastructure where they can get uh, calls sent, sent their way. And uh, the solution works in two ways. The calls can be voice over IP, so on the computer where the computer is doing all the audio. Uh, and there's video services for some of those uh, virtual contact centers as well, or it can actually be sent through your physical phone if you have a phone at your home. Um, and again, th those- That would be so amazing. So yeah, just, those, <laughs> just to let you know, that's exactly what I'm talking about, yes. For sure, so so it might make sense uh, just to, to get your contact information, Maria, if you could put it in the chat. I can maybe reach out separately and give you a little bit of background on some services that might be available in your area. And, uh, and and sort of talk a little bit more about exactly how it works. But, you know, it, it's one that I would say from a from a SAS tall perspective, it, it's a service that's always done well here. When the pandemic hit, it became unbelievably invaluable. We had to scale it up dramatically uh, here for healthcare in particular, healthcare, you know, all sorts of people were wanting to phone in to find out what do I do about COVID? Where do I get tested? Where do I get this? Where do I get that? And so they had to scale the volume of agents that they had to be able to take those calls. All of them had to be at home because you couldn't pack people into to an office anymore, and so the service really just was a you know an absolute no brainer to scale uh, to scale that capacity during COVID times. And uh, and as I mentioned, there's a number of people that provide those services. So so if I if I can get your contact info out of the chat there, I'll make a copy of it and I'll reach out directly and we can talk about it further. Oh, I'm really looking forward to that chat. Um, Scott and I've already uh, hunted you down on LinkedIn and <laughs> and sent my contact information. Thank you I so see much. There. Thank you. Bye. Thank Excellent. you, Maria. Thank you, Scott. Um, another question from the chat here. Um, what are some of the biggest benefits Saskia has seen as a result of digital transformation? You want to start on that one, Barb? 
Sure. I think, uh, you know, one of them is being able to, you know, from a customer perspective, for sure, is being able to meet the customer expectation and the customer demand. You know, as we said, they want to, uh, you know, customers want to contact you through the channel that they want. And they often want to go in and out of channels, depending on where they are in the customer journey. So they change channels partway through uh, sometimes to do that. So I think we've really benefited from that because, you know, before it was always what the customer saw was totally different from what the agent saw. And they'll say, I want this thing or I want what's on the billboard. And it was hard to make the internal systems look like that. So that's one of the things that we've tried to make closer uh, to matching is that, uh, you know, so the agent does appear, you know, or the frontline person does appear knowledgeable, you know, is knowledgeable, feels better about serving the customer, you know, is engaged and, you know, the customer is getting what they what they want, depending on the channel that they come through. And as I said, we we find that our customers start in one channel and change and go to another. Um, you know, as Scott pointed out in the beginning, you know, when I started the company, there was over 5,000 employees. And through attrition, uh, you know, people have retired. And as we've automated uh, lower value tasks, you know, we haven't had to replace, uh, you know, replace those folks Um and, you know, lots of them, we did have, you know, some jobs that were lower value tasks, and we just couldn't even get people to fill them anymore. You know, people just didn't want to do them. So we've had to, um, you know, automate those tasks, sometimes out of necessity over the years. And, you know, it's proven, uh, it's proven valuable, because we have higher value work for people. And then our, you know, the size of the company has gone down, as well as being able to add complexity to the services, you know, they keep getting more and more complex. Um, and, you know, us having higher skilled folks to do that, um, you know, has done us uh, in very good stead. I don't know if you want to add anything, Scott. Yeah, no, I think that that covers a lot of it, Barb. But to me, you know, the values we've seen out of it have, have sort of been three or maybe multifold. Um, one is, as Barb mentioned, we've been able to take people and retrain them and move them to higher value tasks. The second is we have been able to go down in our FTE complement. So we, we, we are very proud of investing in our people and retaining people, but you know, over time we've also had to manage the bottom line. So, so through, through digital transformation and automation, we've been able to remove roles. And uh, one thing we're very proud of as a company is we've always done that through attrition. So we've never taken a set of roles and said, okay, you're, you're done. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, we've always been able to move people to other opportunities and sort of as people retire, bring our FTE complement down to keep our expense line in, in place. And, and the third is, is really sort of being able to serve the client how they want, when they want, where they want. And especially in, you know, as the demographics of our client base change, our, our older population, they're very established customers, very good customers for us, but they don't make changes to their services. They don't move as much. Our younger population, they're in university, they're moving around, they're, they want to be able to get online at two in the morning, make a change, book a new service, change a change a feature on their service. Uh, they don't necessarily want to talk to people that are very well disposed to using technology. And so investing in that automation really allows us to serve that customer base who's, who, uh, you know, they maybe don't have as much of a volume of business, but their, their number of transactions with us is higher. And we're able to serve them in the way that they want to be served. Thank you, Scott and Bob. Um, we do have another question in the chat from an Antonio Prescott. Antonio's question is, do you think hybrid work adoption by companies is something we can maybe see later in the year or even next year in the Caribbean? Hybrid work adoption by companies. My, my suspicion is that yes, and, and not only will you see it, I think you'll have to see it. Um, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, with, with the, uh, the amount of work from home we did over the last two years, um, you know, people like working from home. They're, they're very capable of, of delivering in work from home models. Um, but also, if you do it over a long period of time, you lose a little bit of that camaraderie or <laughs> teamwork or je ne sais quoi, uh, so to speak. And so, so companies do need to bring people back in the office to get some of that collaboration re rebuilt. And, and uh, uh, But if you, I believe firmly, if you try to bring everyone back in the office full time, you're going to see people that are going to take other opportunities. Uh, and the reality is we're, we're faced with it on our company. We do a lot of software development and, you know, people can work for us out of their basement or they can work for Facebook or Google. And in fact, we've lost employees to, to those companies over the last little while, just because, you know, they can work from home, they can make 
more money and their desk didn't change, their office didn't change, their employer did and their paycheck did. And so, so it's incumbent upon us as employers to figure out those models that, that uh, sort of make people happy, right? So they, they have that right balance of being able to work from home, but we as an employer also ensure that we've got that balance of being able to get them into the office, get the collaboration, create that stickiness of wanting to work together uh, that's required. So I, I firmly believe hybrid work models are gonna be required across the industry. Anything to add there, Barb? No, I think we're seeing it already. I mean, there is a company in the Caribbean that we are working with and they, you know, do, they are just engaging in a hybrid model now. So we are starting to see that for sure with one of the companies we work with. Alex has another question. And I'm trying to paraphrase, make sure I get it correctly, but how do you balance the two competing sides of selling automation to the C-suite on the basis of efficiency and cost savings versus the employee base fearing job loss? That's a excellent question. And uh, you know, our, our model, both internally and in terms of how we try to sell is we, we aren't focused on bringing that FTE count down. We're focused on how do we invest, you know, take those savings that you get from automation and invest in your people, retain that business knowledge that you have and focus them on higher value tasks. And, and the reality is, if you look at our parent company and our, and our experience has been over a bit of a longer period, but we've been able to bring that FTE count down, but not through, you know, carving people out through automation. Uh, we've done it through attrition and we've been able to retain that business knowledge invest in those people to, to do other higher value tasks. And that's really the model, you know, we, we, we kind of practice what we preach. That's really the model that, that uh, you know, we want, uh, we want to see other telecoms adopt, right? Is invest in automation, free up that capacity and, and reuse that business knowledge to drive higher value tasks within your business. Uh, and you can reduce the FTE counts over time where it makes sense and uh, uh, in the best way possible. Bob, anything to add? No, I think that that says that, I mean, our policy is, uh, you know, in 110 years, we don't lay off people. Uh, that is a strong company policy. And every president we have that comes in holds that policy where we we don't lay off people. So we we retrain, uh, you know, our folks, like we said, there are some some jobs where, you know, they're not needed anymore. So we redeploy and reskill people. Another question in the chat here. Were there challenges for your organization with the transfer of mainly online interaction for staff? And what were your strategies to deal with it so that it kept employee motivation high? So challenges for your organization in the transition of dealing with mainly online interaction for staff. Yeah, I would say we're and Barb can build on this, but we're we're really still going through that transition. So we still all have some fairly large contact centers. We still have stores operational where people will come in and, and you know, discuss their needs and their, you know, the products and services they'd like to see. So we, we still have a lot of either face-to-face -face or, or over the phone transactions with our, our client base, um, but it is evolving to more online. Uh, from an online perspective, we have a lot of self-serve options where, where clients can go in and, you know, with the click of a button, uh, gain new service or, or change services. Um, we also have chat services now where people can come in and ask questions. And so, so those interactions are certainly different for those contact center agents doing it over chat versus uh, doing it over the phone. Uh, but again, our employee base is changing. So a lot of the people we have in those contact centers are young people coming out of school. They're used to transacting online. Frankly, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I'm sure some of them would much prefer to chat with somebody than to have a conversation or or, or meet with them face to face. So, so I don't think we've had a lot of challenges with that that change, but it's also been a little bit more gradual. So it's not like we went overnight and and suddenly everybody had to figure out how to deal with only online transactions. We still have a large volume of people that come into our stores and or come come into our contact centers and talk to people to get services put in place. Anything you'd add there, Barb? Yeah, kind of how we did that gradually in our contact centers was the technology that, that we use to manage transactions in the contact center, it is um, omni-channel. And so we started down that journey uh, several years ago, well, many years ago now, where the, the employees can get, uh, they can get a chat, they can get an email, they can get a call, they can get a task. So for many years, 
um, you know, that has been happening, you know, and obviously as the chat channels and email channels grow, you know, email was the first thing before chat, you know, where they would get an email. And one of the things we did struggle with is certainly uh, the folks that you hire to think on their feet, to talk on the phone and be able to get an answer in 10 seconds are typically not the same as sit and well craft emails, you know, that are grammatically correct and that sort of thing. So certainly, you know, templates and things like that for answers to make sure that, you know, you were giving a proper full answer. It was, you know, grammatically correct, all those things. So we did struggle with that in the beginning, you know, especially with email, uh, you know, as times have changed, chat is different, but we still have some of those templates. But I think when we went into COVID, because we had done, uh, you know, that transition and it was gradual, it wasn't as shocking to people uh, because it had been gradual with our omni-channel solutions. I suppose just a follow up to that then, do you see, you put up a map where it's, I can see that you guys have a significant geographic footprint. Um, how key a component is the culture of a particular part of the world? Like, do you see a difference in attitude to technology in the Caribbean versus your hometown versus, you know, mainland US and other areas you worked in? Is, is the culture of the area an issue at all? Is this something that you factor in and do you find yourselves having to tweak your approach based on the culture of the, of the area? Yeah, it, it does factor in. I think uh, my experience is less so over time. It seems like, uh, uh, you know, as the technology is becoming available a little bit more ubiquitous around the world, the, the culture of how that technology is adopted is, is aligning. Um, but certainly culture has an impact. And that's one of the things we, we try to be very cognizant of when we go into different geographical areas is understanding that local culture. Uh, and, and trying to ensure that we're ingrained and, and, and sort of working with the culture. And, uh, you know, one of the unique things about Saskatchewan and, and people that work here and work for our company is that, uh, you know, community involvement and participation and sort of the, the things that we do away from the office to, to stay ingrained in the community. It's a very important part of our, our culture here at, at our company and, and our, I would say our culture in this province. And uh, it's very interesting to me on some of these projects that we've done, uh, you know, we send people out and they become extremely ingrained, ingrained in the local culture, become, you know, participating and volunteering in different organizations uh, locally. And again, that's how you sort of understand and, and build up that appreciation for the local culture. And that feeds back into to the business, right? You understand sort of some of those nuances of maybe why people want to transact a little bit differently in, in, in your region versus our region. And uh, the only way to get that experience is by experiencing it. Good point. Um, Bob, anything to add to that? I think too, um, not just the area, but, you know, certainly the different uh, companies we work with and customers is that each company has its own culture as well in each unique culture. And especially the way they treat their customers and treat their employees. So as Scott said, we're very cognizant of that because each, each company can have just a, you know, for sure its own unique culture and how they treat their customers and how they treat their employees. And so, you know, we are very cognizant of that and make sure that we work with the company to achieve those goals um, and help them, uh, you know, exceed those for sure. Okay, I think maybe it's time for one more question, just sort of a broad one. Um, and that is, what is the best way to invest in people? That's a, that's a very broad question. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure there's a perfect singular answer. And to me, it's, it's really looking at uh, your people and, your, and the opportunities that you have to create for them. And uh, again, when I look at our, our own internal uh, approach, not to say that everything we've done is is best, but you know the phrase that we we've had on the side of our of our technicians' vans for years. You know our focus is our customer, our strength is our people, and really investing in people is, is helping them understand your business, uh, be passionate about your business, and have all the right tools, knowledge, and capabilities to deliver so that that they feel like they're they're set up for success. And if if you can do that, their passion will shine through, and you know they're probably going to stick around in your organization for years to come. So a, a bit of a political uh, wishy-washy answer, but I really believe that's the truth. Uh, Barb, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think too, it's even when you're, um, you know, recruiting is making sure that the, the people coming into the company, they understand the company values and, and what it means to be an employee of that company. And like Scott said, we, you know, we really pride ourselves on, on volunteerism and, um, you know, working in our communities. And so, 
you know, that's one of the things that, you know, when we're recruiting people, we want to make sure that we do have people that align to those values. And I think if people are working for a company that they believe in and, and, you know, they believe in your vision and your values of what you're trying to do to, to serve your customers. Um, I think those, those employees are more loyal and, you know, if you invest in those people uh, they'll take care of your customer. Thank you. So I've got any closing remarks before we, we wrap this session up? Is there anything you'd like to say? No, just uh, maybe a thank you. You know, thanks to the Canto folks for, for organizing this. Again, you know, I've participated in, in a few of the conferences and a number of these sessions, both as an attendee and, and a presenter. And, you know, especially in the time of COVID here where we can't get together quite as easily. I hope that's coming back soon, but where we can't get together face to face quite as easily. It's, it's great to have these sessions where we can all share a little bit of information and background. And, uh, as I said at the start of the presentation, you know, we're a pretty open book. So if, if people have any questions around, you know, what SASTEL has done, what's been, you know, what's been successful for us, what hasn't been, we're, we're more than willing to have conversations, connect people into peers in our organization that, that do the same roles that you do and, and share information. Uh, and as I said, it's a bit selfish because we find out that sharing that information quite often turns into opportunity for us. And, and uh, so we're willing to do it at any time. Oh. Yeah, I just appreciate the opportunity. It's my first time um, speaking at Canto and uh, really appreciate the opportunity and uh, appreciate the questions and the interactions. And as Scott said, we're really willing to share knowledge. So feel free to reach out anytime for folks who, who joined. And if you want information or we can help share experience, absolutely willing to do that. Thank you. It's been a very interesting discussion. I mean, I think there is almost a, always a lot of focus on customer NPS and that's almost become like a buzzword, but the link to employee NPS and how important employee NPS is to the success of an organization, I think um, doesn't get the attention it deserves. And I think your presentation clearly illustrates that there's a, a real synergy to be had between those two things. You can improve your customer experience, but also um, provide a better working environment and more opportunities for advancement for your employees. Um, so thank you very much for what was an incredibly insightful discussion. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in July. Uh, we will have this session posted on social media. So if you missed any bits of the conversation, you can catch it again. So thank you to our listening audience. And coming up in July, July 17th to 20th in Miami, Florida, it's the return of the in-person annual conference and trade exhibition on 37th. We hope to see you all there. Keep tuned, keep, post, keep looking at our social media pages for more details. And they will be posted in the upcoming days and weeks. Keep posted for further updates. We're really hoping to see you all there. We're going to be back with our bang. It's our first in-person event in two years, and it's not one that you want to miss. So I think the last thing we have to do is to tell you that we're going to tee you up our next Canto Conversations, which is happening soon. And we'll have data Stu speaking on the topic, a Caribbean ICT Vision 2030. Think global, act regional, serve local. The date for that will be posted on our social media. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.